Um, so as I was saying, you can start from the cancentral.com site to get to the members only site. Click on the members only. Um, of course, uh, I did not log out of here previously. So um, what I will do is I'll log out and log back in so that everybody can see um, exactly what that looks like. So I'll close the browser and, and reinitiate this. So uh, TAM Central, or the TAM's homepage is tamcentral.com, and then you can click on the members only, and then it'll prompt for the password to sign in. And then uh, I was going to go through the, you know, a handful of, of key um, sections of the member site. And I, there's, this is a SharePoint site, and there's capabilities here that I am not even was not familiar with. I keep learning. Um, so uh, the conversion scripts being the thing that gets maintained for others, and then you can register for notification anytime these get updated. So um, in the uh, library uh, tab, you can select an alert me. And you can set the alert on the library. I think you can actually go down and set an alert on an individual, um, uh, you know, member uh, of a, like a file. Uh, I'm not exactly sure if, if you view properties and all, but I think it's most pertinent to uh, set the alert up at the library level. And then when you do that, I think it um, prompts for some settings like when. I, th I think the defaults are uh, appropriate. It's when anything changes on all changes, and uh, it'll send you an email. But it will you have there's an internal email address for the for the SharePoint site, which is a tamcentral.com, but it is linked to an external email address also. And by default, it should show your external email address, which would be your your business address. So. Um, so setting up the alerts will let you know any time a, a script uh, changes. Um, I think that uh, what I will um, do here uh, after this is to show um, that when an alert comes in, that you will be able to log into this repository and then download. So if I want to sort by mo date modified, I believe I can just click on that. And uh, April 25th of 2018 is when um, this SharePoint site got turned up. But you can see the most recent one was a Windstream for uh, PDF invoices. And um, there's a little description here about that it's designed for a PDF file that is copied and pasted from a PDF to a text file. And then the script is run based on that. Um, in order to get a copy of it, you can click on the little menu uh, and the submenu, and you can download a copy and put that on your on your uh, platform locally. Uh, another capability that I just learned about, uh, actually I learned about it today, is this capability up here called Connect to Outlook. And apparently, you can synchronize with Outlook. And SharePoint, since they're you know Microsoft products, that they have an integration between them, and there is a mechanism so that when these update, they will synchronize into your local Outlook folder. I haven't used it, so I can't really speak to how that works. But um, I found uh, that somebody else uh, that is a Tams user uh, has that uh, in place. So um, apparently, you can. Set that up and, and link out your local Outlook with the uh, SharePoint site, and then anytime there's an update, you get an automatic uh, copy of that. So uh, maybe um, maybe use that. We'll be able to um, share their experience with others. Let's see. Um, so I'll get into the details of those uh, scripts in a minute. Uh, the other capability that is uh, very commonly used uh, is the um, see, I'm going to go back to the home page is the uh, announcements and calendar 
Uh, the announcements, obviously, I think they're worth registering for because whenever there's a new version of, of software uh, or we put in the quarterly updates to the federal universal service fee rates, we update this announcement on an ongoing basis. Um, the most recent release, when they become available, they they show up under the announcements. And again, it's a, a library within uh, the site that can have uh, a separate alert uh, established so that you receive notification whenever there's a, um, a release, like we had our service release back in December. Um, those are the primary uh, uh, announcements that we put as module releases or uh, software updates or the FUSF. Uh, the calendar is another area that I think is, um, you know, well, it's, it's, it's used regularly in terms of showing when there's availability or a holiday for when support would not be available and when our user groups are scheduled for. Um, not much else goes on here, but uh, certainly um, if we were to, you know, schedule in, um, you know, a, some, you know, we've had other uh, presenters that have given, presented to the user group that we would put the details of those. Otherwise, just the general conference parameters are listed in the um, in the tasks uh, or on the uh, appointments in the calendar. Uh, let's see, training videos. Oh, so one of the, I think one of the other um, most uh, relevant um, repositories or libraries within the Share site, SharePoint site is what's called shared documents. And there's there's a mishmash of different uh, documents, um, but uh, I'll point out some of the, the, the main ones uh, is the most recent version of the software is available here for, for download in a zip file. The report viewer, which I'm gonna mention, uh, is, is uh, it's here uh, under the um, uh, download. Now, uh, do you use the report viewer yourself, Hamid? Um, yes, I, I, I do have the Times Report Viewer installed on my computer, so. Okay, okay. so you can double click a, a saved report file and just open it from the Report Viewer. Yep. And of course, um, most people know that you can also, within TAMS, open any saved report file, but that the Report Viewer is um, allowed to be redistributed to your end users um, and there's no extra cost for that. The license is, is included and bundled with our Crystal Reports engine, uh, and so it's allowed to be redistributed. So um, anyway, I just wanted to uh, kind of highlight that, that that's also available from, for download here. And um, there's a few other like quick start guides or if somebody's moving a database, there's a standalone database setup tool, which we would send to an administrator, let's say in a hosted environment or whatever, where you have a DB administrator and they need to be able to attach a TANS database and configure all of the um, security logins and all. So um, that's available here. Again, those are tend to be very um, like one time uh, uh, limited needs. But there's this training document and I'm gonna open it up. Um, and uh, it's a Word document that uh, has a, a link to, um, oh, I, I have to, I'm, I'm being prompted to put in my username and password, so hang on a second. <coughs> and I forget my password, so give me just a second here, I can look that up. Um, Uh, here it is. I think this will work. No. How come uh, Time Central asked you to sign in again? You were already signed in, right? Uh, good question. I think. Uh, um, 
Yeah, I'm not exactly sure. Hmm. Well, I'm I'm wondering if if it's because of this word. Oh, it, it says it cannot do it. So let me just uh, download it. It doesn't re require it when I'm downloading, so I'm not sure what um, why it would. Uh, let's just go to my downloads. Save. I'm not sure. I, it, it was the first time I ever tried to open it from the website using right. Word. Right. right. Um, but it did not prompt me when I downloaded it. So now I have my download, so I'll just uh, open it up and talk about it. So in here is um, a series of, uh, of well, first of all, there's a, a main YouTube channel, uh, which is the TAMS training channel. So that document will take you right to the YouTube channel. And then within that channel are a series of, of uh, training videos. And within them, you can go straight to the video if you want to by clicking on these links. Some of the videos, we've documented the, the time points within the video for certain um, you know, elements of the tool. So we felt like this document here, which would be searchable, would get somebody to a video that's maybe many uh you know an hour or more in length that you could find uh by searching this and getting to a very specific uh element within that video and then you can just click on that link and it'll take you to that uh time point in that, in that video so um we I, you know, as as uh, and so you can see that several of them are broken down in, in quite a bit of detail. There's some others that we haven't, you know, added the the uh, you know particular points in time regarding specific elements of the video. But um, I think that these are all good. And of course, the more recent ones are going to be more pertinent to newer capabilities. Some of the older ones. Uh, you know, obviously, as we keep adding functionality to the tool, they may be a little bit um, out of date, but uh, most of them will still have to be relevant. Um, they just want to uh, address some of the newer, more advanced functionality. So that video, that document is available also from the member site, and then from there, you have access to all the videos. Yeah, it's, it's good that you have added those uh, specific, uh, you know, time uh, points that uh, when somebody need when one needs something immediately for any yes. specific question, you can get to it right right away. The timestamps are uh, yeah. are are key. Um, so let's see here, uh, and and that's something that also, of course, there's the help files. Um, this uh, particular video that I'm recording today for this uh, member or for the user group, I'll put it up there and add it to that document. So you'll, if you're registered for uh, that library to get to get an alert, uh, you'll get an alert whenever I update that document with the new links to the video. It takes a little while to upload the video, and then I think um, YouTube takes some time to convert it to high def or something like that. So um, there's a little bit of a Maybe wait 24 or 48 hours. Uh, I find to before everything on the YouTube side is uh, is, is the way it's supposed to be. Uh, let's see here. So um, go right back to my member site. There was one other item that I wanted to go over, and that was the report viewer. And I mentioned that, but uh, it's available for download off of the main page of the TAM Central member site. So you can download it here. Um, but you will not be able to um, have a link for your clients uh, to download it from here because this requires a login. So you'd have to download it and then distribute it at your own, you know, discretion. How would you compare that to the uh, uh, the login credentials that that uh, we can give to our clients to use to log in versus sending them Times Viewer and say install it on your computers 
Could you could you repeat that? Sure. I was wondering. In the past, I used to just uh, you know send them the uh, or or give them a link to the Tams viewer. Uh, you're saying that we could we can send the Tams viewer to our clients to use it to 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 install it on their systems. Uh, but there's also a login for guest uh, usage of Times Viewer that that you have provided me, and I you, you know I, I I have let my clients know how how to read their crystal reports with that by by logging in as a as a guest and, and read. Oh, that. we do have a guest login. That's correct. Right. Um, how would you? I think that to... actually would still work. Uh, you know, just because we had to move our uh, SharePoint site because the old hosting provider which was Dell they shut down their hosting we we had to move everything to this new hosting site and um, let me see here I think it's something like free trial or something like that right then my question was well, what how would you compare these two ways of uh, letting our clients to be able to read their uh, crystal reports uh, you know, using the, those that login credentials or to send them the TAMS viewer software and say install it and use it. Which, which way would you go and what, what are the pros and cons of each? Well, it's pretty big. So if you try to email it to them, even in a zipped form, it may exceed a, you know, a, a message size limit that could be in place. So that would be one uh, con of trying to just send them the uh, the file. Uh, and of course, if you don't, if, even if it's a since it's a self-extracting executable, even if you put it inside of a zip, many antivirus software programs will block it. Like Outlook will not allow an attachment with an executable inside of a zip file. So emailing it because of size and antivirus. Um, you know procedures it may may block it so having a, a place to download it from the web is probably um, the, the best uh, way to get it to them and it, let's see if let's just try this to make sure that the um, uh, I'm going to sign out and then uh, I think if I put in let's try this link here if I put in, let me try to edit this. There's the website. And then I think it's free trial is the uh, login. And I believe this is the password for free trial. So let's try it. So member site, free trial. This password. It has restricted access, so they cannot get to the scripts or anything, but let's see here. Here's the report viewer, and to download that, and there it is. So yes, it looks like it would work fine. So uh, yeah, you can direct them to uh, our member site with that free trial credentials. So they would, even after using the login credential, they would still have to download and install the report viewer to obviously be able to view them, right? Yes. Yeah. It, it does require a local installation of the software. Sure. Okay. Um, so we talked about uh, the setup alerts already for the scripts. So within the, um, when you download the zip file, um, let me open up a uh, folder here. So there will be uh, a series of, of files within any zip file. Maybe I can 
um, let's see if I can find the zip one. Okay. Here's the uh uh well that's not a good example. Well there is a, a, a zip file on the website called convert and it is kind of the um master uh for for getting set up and I'll show you that one. So under conversion scripts, there's one here called convert. And it's the zip files and folders for the initial setup of the conversion scripts. And in it, here is what is inside of that, is there's some uh, instructions. There's the Gawk engine that is needed to be installed first time. There's a, a single batch file that is used by all of the scripts. There's also a TAMS library of functions that is a, a common library of aux scripts. Um, there's an executable for extracting PDF files to text files. There's a configuration file, which is all described in the setup instructions. Um, there's another um, a PDF control file. It's a configuration file. It's standard. And these all get extracted into separate folders and locations. Uh, the recommendation in the instructions is to put the convert folder at the uh, top level of a C drive, like we have here, C slash convert. And then you would put this um, and in that folder and extract it, and it would create the subfolders and put the master bat, bat, bat file in that subfolder, and uh, it puts the INI file here and so forth. So um, that is what is um, the first time setup. What is typical inside of a normal, once it, the environment is established and all of the subordinate or dependent um, programs are available and installed, after that, any other script that uh, is going to be um, updated would be something along the lines of this, like Verizon Wireless PDF. And it's a zip file. And um, I'll go ahead and download it just to demonstrate what it looks like. And in here are going to be, now here's a master bat dot bat. And it has not changed since 2014. So it, it's only was we included these common files in all of the zip files. And maybe it would be best at this point to only put those that are unique within the zip file. And that anything that's common, keep that over in the convert folder. And uh, that way it simplifies the number of, of components that each individual script really needs to, you know, um, be concerned with. So uh, there's also this PDF to text because this is a PDF extracted uh, script. Again, it's not not necessary to do anything with this copy. And really, I would welcome any uh, recommendations that if removing these common files that are shared. Uh, like these four out of six are really not needed whenever a script gets updated um, because, unless they happen to change, but they rarely, rarely change. They don't change for years. So the only two that are relevant are the two, and you can see that if you sort by modified date, the only two that have been updated recently is the VBS, which is the um, uh, user interface that pops up the little window that you type a command line into and it gives some instructions about the nature of the input file and what the options are for the output um, and then the script itself that does all the work so you know anytime a script's updated if these are the you know, 
you know, only two that have a timestamp that are newer than the version you have, then it's very simple. You would go to the um, C drive where your root, we call it the root conversion folder, and you would take the VBS and put it into the convert folder, and you would take the awk and put it into Gox scripts. Now I have one in there. This one happens to be newer. So let's go ahead and replace that. Let me let me cancel this and then we'll come in here and see. Oh, I have a, the V Verizon Wireless, but that's from 2017. So I definitely would want to update that one. Okay. Now there's a, a methodology for having shortcuts for each of the scripts, and uh, those are, again, described in the setup instructions, but uh, it's simple enough, you just uh, create a short, shortcut. Um, I, I like to take the name shortcut off of here. Different versions of Windows will either add that to the name or not. You change the property so that it, um, Always start in whatever folder the shortcut is run from. Click apply. And then put that into the uh, shortcuts folder, which is where you would always take a copy from. This is kind of like a master repository. So this way, you don't have to have copies of the software all over the place. You only need to main one master copy of the software, and then you just have a copy of a shortcut that you use to point to the master copy of the software. So you can make this a copy of the shortcut over and over, all around, you know, to multiple clients that all have Verizon Wireless, and uh, they all point back to the same location. And when you run it, it's the VBS that gives you this dialog. And then, of course, there's the syntax and all the options. This one happens to have a lot of different options. Some of them only have three or four. Uh, one of the most uh, useful options, though, is the dash H command. And that will give you an insight about the uh, script. Sometimes we have, um, let me see if I can find the example here. Uh, let me close this. Okay. I think I have a uh, folder here that I can give a demonstration. Okay, so I'm wanting the script and I can put in here And I'm going to do a dash H. And that is very common in a lot of the newer scripts that we started to do this three or four years ago. And that is to put a printout help. And one of the things that we try to do in the help, this is what the Verizon Wireless help looks like. Now, if it's something like Windstream or AT&T or whatever, if we're given information about how to get to that particular input file, like log into a certain portal, um, follow a certain menu tree to generate a certain report that the script was d developed against, and of course, well, sometimes we're just given the input file and we don't know how the end user got it, but if we're given those instructions, we can include it here, and then anybody else that wants to know how to get that file from that service provider could look at the help and it could guide them on how to generate that. Now, of course, if you have your own employees, you know, it can help. Um, now, having said that, um, many times we document what the script was developed against uh, and then the, you know, supplier changes their website around, changes their reports or whatever. So, um, 
you know, it's probably a better than a 50% chance that it's so accurate, but, but obviously, um, it changes with time. Uh, and, um, sometimes we don't have the details, uh, given to us. So we put in the, in the help, what we have. So anyway, just, um, a useful, uh, information or insight about the scripts. Any questions about that? No, I have not. Uh, this is the first time I see the dash H dash H uh, uh, switch or, or option. Interesting. Right. So that's yeah. That's kind of why I wanted to go over it. And of course, I'm capturing this on a recording for this meeting. Okay. And then uh, we already went over where to store the files, and that's all defined in the um, instructions, uh, the PDF instructions. But it's flexible enough to allow any root folder for the convert. Uh, and there's an INI file that also allows you to point to different locations. I think it's best to just keep it simple. Um, okay. The last thing I had on the agenda was about the external plans. And uh, that one is going to be very simple. And that is that whenever um, you're in TAMS, if you have, uh, you know, active maintenance, then within our, your supplier database, we have a uh, repository in the cloud of plans that are available to be imported. And all of these were imported. They all have ZZ4 because they came from the cloud database. Um, and there are a lot of suppliers, like, I don't know, there's over 100 suppliers, but we have not scrubbed all of the plan data from anything that would be sensitive. So um, they may, they're not all made public right now, okay? Uh, we did go through and made uh, a lot of the most common ones, particularly for cellular, like Verizon Wireless, um, uh, the flex business and the um, travel pass and the um, uh, you know many other common plans available and uh, if there are is there a supplier that you're interested in a certain type of plan and you don't see it in the online database and I'll show you here in a moment how to see those um, you can send us an email about hey do you happen to have a plan you know for you know um, the SIP trunking with uh, with AT and T or their MPLS network, um, AVPN and things like that, then we can look at those things uh, on request. And if we do, uh, we'll scrub those uh, on demand and make them available, uh, make them public. And then you'll be able to import those. So it might save uh, some time, particularly uh, when it comes to. Uh, I mean, we thought the cellular were some of the uh, more challenging ones, but uh, uh, there's just a, a large number of. I mean, literally, like there's like five thousand plans in that database, and uh, we just need to make sure that we don't um, put out any proprietary information in them. Good on both so, counts. Both counts. Thank you. <laughs> Pardon me? I said good on both counts. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so anyway, so now notice I'm sitting here with this test supplier, but I could have picked any supplier. So, you know, I could have said, well, I'm going to be working with Cox Communications uh, and I want to import plans to my Cox Communications. Um, but this test supplier is just a, a dummy uh, that, that's set up in this demo database. And I can come into the plan, supplier plans tab and click import external plans. And uh, when I do that, it's going to, um, now you could even import plans within your own database. So you could go from your own database to your own database and move plans from client or from supplier to supplier. So, you know, just realize that that's, a, you know, another twist on this capability. But, um, Normally, what you would do is go to this uh, www.tanshuffle.com. This port number is 2301. It's the TAMS SQL Server. It's the instance name of SQL Server, and it's the TAMS uh, plans uh, uh, database. And you click Connect, 
And up here, it then requires you to log in to the external database. And of course, you you know, with the active maintenance, you have an active login. And it will be the same root name of your CAN's central member site and the same password. Um, so once you log in, it'll show you the available suppliers that we have active plans for in the external database. This is not by any means the full capability. Like I said, we've got 5,000 plans and probably, a, you know, maybe a hundreds of different suppliers. So, you know, there's a lot uh, available there. Um, but again, maybe AT&T or Verizon Wireless are uh, your most common. Let's just take Verizon Wireless as an example. And here are the plans that we have scrubbed. And you'll notice there's actually more here. So like new Verizon plan for business jetpack, um, travel passes, um, there are uh, the share everything, single device plans, um, unlimited smartphone plans. So you can filter this. And we try to, um, like some of them are grouped like ZZ9 is um, for some uh, kind of legacy um, uh, talk and text plans or messaging plans. I think the keyword like flex might be more appropriate. And of course, we try to name them exactly as they're named by the suppliers. And that's universal across all of our planes. So you, this would, you know, even their abbreviations are copied. <laughs> so if you find something in an invoice, you might be able to copy and paste it right into this um, search field and, and find the planes you want. And then you can cherry pick by holding the control button down and pick two or three, or you can do a block select and hold the shift button down and select them all. And then you just click the import selected records and they will come in I'm going to cancel this, and they will come in to your um, database. If they duplicate a name, they will uh, put an asterisk at the end as many times as necessary so that there aren't um, duplicate names in your database. And when it does get imported, it'll, in, it'll include a note as to when it was imported. So you can see this one was imported twice. That's why the second one has a has a uh, uh, an asterisk on it, you know. But um, anyway, so the, uh, and it you know will bring in the details. Now it may be relevant only to a particular state, so your taxes may not be valid for your particular client needs. But um, and as you know, filling in these forms or cloning them here locally. Is really not a very tedious project either you know but you might find that importing a block of plans from a supplier is, is quite a time saver and gets you going down the right path quicker than you might try to on your own so so, so that's it um, that's the uh, uh, review of the external TAMS plans database any questions about that no, they, these are good refreshers for me, and I learned a couple of things uh, in the meantime. Uh, one thing that I have, though, uh, Chris, uh, is that I think I have set up several alerts, and and so whenever there is a new converter, uh, I get I get several alerts, you know, and so I, I probably don't need all of them. It doesn't bother me, but uh, I probably need to reduce them to maybe one, so I only get one announcement when a new converter is is, uh, is loaded there. Yeah, and the other way of looking at that, maybe maybe try that um, synchronize with Outlook uh, might be a simpler way than dealing with the alerts that you'll just automatically, if that works that way, I'm not sure if, but if it works that way, you can just, um, you know, anytime it gets updated, you automatically get the most recent copy. Well, that 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 looks like a very interesting uh, capability. However, you still, I think, would want to have at least one alert, even if uh, there's a uh, you know an Outlook folder somewhere that automatically gets updated with any new uh, new software or new announcements. 
uh, you still need to get an alert to know and look for it and go look for it, right? I, I, and did you say you get multiple alerts? I did. I did, and, and yeah. I do receive several emails whenever the, there is something new on, on TAM Central. I think I've uh, enabled several different types of alerts, so I get right. uh, like several people telling me, hey, there is something new. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think one of the things that happens um, is that, like, for example, recently I added this Windstream PDF. When I add it, I, I drag and drop it in here, and it adds it, but it doesn't give any sort of description. So then after it uploads it, I go in and edit it, and I edit the title, and I think that sends out a second alert. So I think anytime I add a new one, you'll get two alerts, one when I add it and one when I edit the description. Right. So this accounts right. for two of them. But I, I do usually get about four or five. So I don't, well, I don't well and then if I update the Verizon wireless script, and this is maybe where I want to change, um, like this Verizon wireless script has the same core, um, dark, it wants me to, to open it, um, the same Verizon wireless awk file is in all four of these zips. So when I update the awk file, I have to upload four of the zips. Maybe what I should do is just have the awk file as a separate standalone, and then I don't need to uh, update all four zips. Sure. Yeah, that, that might yeah. be a solution, sure. Yeah, because I think that's what you're probably seeing is every time I update Verizon Wireless, I have these four different versions because there's like a batch mode and there's one from a PDF that's copied and pasted and there's one that reads right from the PDF, you know, and so um, anytime I update the script. So I, I maybe maybe that uh, would be a better design is for me to take out all of the common stuff and then also um, anything that's like a um, just a standalone awk file that is common to more than one zip file, just make it a separate download. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, that that said, be a probably a better uh, organization um, of, and cut down on all those those uh, um, alerts that you're getting. So. All right. Thank you. Okay. Good point. Sure. Um. All right. Anything else? Uh, nothing else on my mind at this time. Okay, so for the next meeting, um, you know, anything else, of course, that's requested, I'll add to the agenda, but I am going to plan on going over um, form letter uh, templates, uh, where they're stored, how they're edited, and what the fields are that are available. Um, and, you know, the, the, a lot of that, of course, is documented in help, but uh, form letters are, uh, you know, a integral part of of, uh, of the management of the client and um, the suppliers. And so I thought that that would be worthwhile, particularly things like the TAR and um, the service agreements and things that um, are, uh, we use them all the time. And, and the, particularly if you have more than one uh, user in the organization, how the, this common set of templates is shared among every all the users and then the other thing was the reports and uh again um a review of the drill down the exporting the report viewer um and uh, just ad hoc reports so so reports and form letters will be kind of the two main uh, areas of review sounds good i'm looking forward to it. great well, thanks for joining. Um, I uh, will go ahead and end this recording and uh, post it. And um, I'll update the, uh, the document that will uh, point to it um, for the library. And uh, I guess that's it. So anything else that comes up in the meantime, give me a shout. All right. Th thank you, Chris. And good, good luck okay. to you and Rene on, on the doctor's uh, visit. Right. Thank you very much. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.